us here for the Global Progressive Forums webinar. We're talking today about a very important topic. It's obesity, the silent pandemic. Now, some of the figures are incredibly stark. Obesity and obesity-related illness causes around 4 million deaths a year. And yet, somehow, we're not still focusing on this and talking about it like the pandemic it is. So today, we're going to try and put that right. My name is Jennifer Baker. I am an EU policy journalist. And we're coming to you today from the European Parliament to have this discussion and find out what we can learn from other countries around the world. Now, I'm very pleased to have with me hosting today's debate, which will take place in both English and simultaneous translation into Spanish. Remember, you can check whichever one you want while you're watching the live streaming. But I'm joined by Andreas Schieder, who is MEP and co-chair of the Global Progressive Forum. Thank you, Andreas, for being with us here in the room. It's lovely to be back doing this in person again. So let me hand over to you and tell us a bit why it is so important and why now is the time to talk about this question. Yeah, th thank you for, for raising this point. And maybe before answering your question, just giving a two sentences about the Global Progressive Forum. Because it is a global initiative, uh, mainly started by the SND, so the Socialist and Democrats group in the European Parliament, try but trying to connect all over the world, politicians, society, uh, science people, journalists, NGOs, uh, trade unions and others, uh, and discuss how progressive uh, policies can be put forward. So therefore, I think it is a good occasion uh, today that we are discussing also ob obesity, which is silent pandemic, and it's not only about lifestyle, it is a big social question behind. As you mentioned, uh, two billion obese people are living in the world. Uh, obesity and overweight has become a real health source in the world. Uh, it is 28% additional on adults and 47% additional in children over the last 30 years. So there is an increasing problem. As you mentioned, 4 million deaths per year, which is 7% of all deaths, are coming from this. And when, since we are discussing now the last one or even longer only about uh, uh, COVID-19, which is extremely important. We should see there is a lot of other issues also, which are re health related and social related. Just uh, to mention uh, some uh, other c numbers is the, the pandemic also affects one of four young people in rich countries and one of eight in uh, uh, poor countries. And uh, low cost in food is a social issue, but for some people it's not affordable to buy healthy food. Uh, the World Bank, uh, I think, was uh, calculating uh, that it's one, one euro ten cent per day per person, which is, is actually more expensive. And if you sum this up, you end up at 400, 500 euros per year. So you see there is a social impact. And the last point, there is also an industry behind. Junk food is functioning like a drug. It makes you addicted. It is the sugar, it is the purified wheat and, and other uh, issues which are in. And there is also aggressive and effective marketing practices which are going to the, let's say, unhealthy food. And it's uh, 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 less putting this uh, 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 on the healthy one. So I think this webinar today could show what is the problem, where are the solutions, and also we can share globally a lot of practices uh, from the big uh, disco dance today where we can learn, I think, a lot what can be done. Great. Thank you very much. That's an excellent outline for what we're going to talk about. Now, we have some excellent panellists for you that I will introduce. But before we take a look at our panellists, let's have a look at a video that is being prepared for us. Estamos ante una epidemia de sobrepeso, obesidad sí. y diabetes. Toda América va a buscar este modelo de etiquetado nutricional. Los autónomos nuevamente han llegado para quedarse. Estamos viviendo una situación muy dramática, aumento de la obesidad de manera gigantesca. Que lo que está ocurriendo en Chile está ocurriendo en todas partes del planeta. Los mismos Kelo, los mismos Nestlé, industria de la sal, del azúcar y de las grasas saturadas y de las calorías. Esta ley mandató al Ministerio de Salud a establecer límites para esto que llamamos nutrientes críticos. Esos límites a su vez direccionaban a tres normativas. Una, un nuevo sello de advertencia. Cualquier alimento que sobrepasara los límites no iba a poder hacer publicidad dirigida a niños. Como no son salvables, no se pueden vender en colegios y no pueden haber compras públicas del Estado. Los niños hoy día están expuestos a la mitad de publicidad de alimentos poco saludables que veíamos antes de la ley. 
Well, an interesting look there at uh, some of the examples that we will be talking about in more detail. Now, we saw him there in that video that he'd shared with us. Guido Girardi, the senator from Chile, is one of our first panellists. We also have Raj Patel, the professor from the Texas University, based in Austin in the US. Malia Kuhn is the city councillor from the city of San Francisco. And Delman Coates is a pastor of the Baptist Church in Washington. And Julieta Ponce Sanchez is director of the Food Orientation Centre in Mexico City. Thank you all very much for joining us. I know where the time zone is different, so we do appreciate you getting up early to help share your knowledge about this topic. Here in the studio, I'm joined by Swedish MEP and member of the S&D in the European Parliament, Jutta Gutsland. Thank you very much, Jutta. Uh, Guido, let me start with you and first ask you to tell us a bit about your experience in fighting for a change in the law in Chile. Thank you very much indeed. It's a huge challenge, this. And it's very interesting, the name of this uh, debate, Silent pan Pandemic. As you said, four million people dying of, uh, people dying because of these sorts of issues. We see 41 million people dying because of different types of cancer, diabetes, those sorts of diseases. And 15 million people of those 41 million well, 50, 15 million people actually die young. They die of things that could have been avoided. Brain hemorrhages, for example, different complications. So it is, a, it is a pandemic. It's more predatory, I think, than the COVID pandemic. But the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, has the interest of the whole world, of the whole scientific uh, world. But I think this pandemic, the, the obesity pandemic, is uh, more devastating, has a more devastating impact on civilizations as a whole. We understand that all of this is just a big business, uh, the junk food business. It's also a pharmaceutical uh, business. The profits we see from these pharmaceutical companies, they're not necessarily there to deal with issues, to provide uh, palliative uh, technologies we actually see these chronic diseases increasing so we need to change our idea our concept in the un i think we are complicit and in the who as well we are complicit with this means of development this system of development these diseases are a consequence of globalization moving away from healthy foods to junk food and this means, well, this is allowed through publicity, marketing. So we are all complicit. We're silently complicit with industry. These diseases aren't necessarily transmissible in the normal way we think about that. They're being transmitted through TV, through other social media. We know that children uh, want to eat specific uh, foods because they are being influenced uh, in this specific way. And obviously it has an effect on uh, the development. And obviously when uh, in the past when we didn't have very much food, then um, we had to make sure we had enough calories going in. But now we are in a different situation back then we had to eat everything straight away but now we have become addicted to dopamine which is basically what we find in sugar and fat and that's what the industry is using it's using this uh, this addiction to dopamine to sell these foods so let's uh, call a spade a spade this is the most transmissible uh, virus in the world. There's no real uh, chain to cut though. The chain we have here is the public, uh, public television. That's how the virus is transmitted. 
We've seen this for decades. We've seen cereals being sold that seem healthy, but are not. With extra salt, with extra sugar in these cereals. It's basically a metabolic bomb for children. And so children are addicted to fat and sugar right from their childhoods. Similar with tobacco. The earlier you start with tobacco or sugar or fat, the more addicted you become. The more difficult it is to break that addiction. So I think it's very important to understand this. This doesn't just condemn you as a child, but once you grow up, it's very difficult to change your patterns as well. And it will change the diseases that you are likely to get. And we see, therefore, obesity becoming an inherent genetic problem. And obviously that means your future is compromised. So there is responsibility, I think, huge responsibility uh, that we have to shoulder. Finally, we as human beings, obviously we have bacteria throughout our bodies. They did they decide what sort of diseases we get. They're everywhere throughout the body. And this junk food, they are actually feeding into that. We see our biome being uh, transformed. We see extra cases of multiple sclerosis. We see our um, the way we think being changed. So it's a huge, huge challenge. We do need to change the paradigm. We need a paradigm shift. That's why in Chile, uh, in the Senate, we had a committee set up, a standing committee. And obviously we have the senators who are members of that, but also had uh, scientific experts and university members there. And they have voting rights in that committee as well. And therefore in 2007, we actually came up with this uh, draft bill. So first of all, we said we need the right to know, to have the information. But under Thatcher, Reagan, neoliberalism, politics were replaced by the economy. What we wanted to do was to move back the attention to consumers, not allow uh, the market to decide. So that's what we did. We set up this label which would be understandable, which would explain to people they were eating junk food. They're not ri when you buy junk food, you're not actually buying food, you're buying the status of that food. There's an aspirational aspect to uh, these sorts of foods. That's why children uh, specifically are drawn to this. You know, we have lots of different uh, uh, brands uh, that do the same thing, Nike, etc. So we need to break that change, break that chain. That's why we wanted this uh, label to be brought in. We wanted a label that would be understandable so that people understand what is actually in the food that they're eating. There's extra fat, there's extra sugar in this junk food because consumers didn't necessarily know what was in those foods. We wanted people to be able to decide and for that, we needed this label that even a child could understand. We wanted a traffic light uh, system, but industry said no to that. So we took that off the table. And this meant that later on, But we realized later that, you know, we talked to children of six years and above and they actually said that they didn't necessarily understand the uh, red, amber, green uh, system. And that's why we moved to what we actually use now. And we saw, therefore, that the black octagonal icon was more uh, impactful. 
and at that point uh, industry wanted to go back to the uh, traffic light uh, model but we kept we, we stayed with the the black mark so this is a system we have if you have this black label for um, salt calories fat sugar for all of them you understand that that food isn't healthy and then you get into a smarter ecosystem if you have this label uh, which has this black label in it then you understand that it's a different paradigm the junk food industry are the paedophiles of this century they trample over all uh, treaties we have at a global level when we talk about protecting children's health because what they want to do is deceive uh, children and make them eat these things that they should be eating similar to what the tobacco industry does they finance politicians they finance um, fake studies so it's very important this if the if a food stuff has a black label it cannot be uh, marketed advertised on television it's junk food and obviously this is how we're trying to break this chain so if you have a black label on your food you can't use cartoons you can't use any sort of games to sell your food you can't have kinder surprise for example because it's basically junk in a uh, a toy in a junk and that's why i think we have been able to raise awareness to a certain extent and we're basically we're putting taxes if you will on foodstuffs that have greater uh, salt content so since then 2008 2011 we invited the main uh, technical scientific experts and we managed to get this question this uh, question raised at the global level and 2011 finally our law was passed we did have to work against the president in Senate there but the president of the uh, the food industry obviously they were against the law but when we uh, pushed through the law the president vetoed it and therefore we had to go to in front of the presidential palace demonstrate until we managed to get the bill through appreciate your passionate and introduction there and i think again thank you also for the video it was um, very impressive um, i'm glad you've made the connection with tobacco because of course some of these packagings they're similar to what we see in cigarette packaging so i'm sure we will come back to that but i'm keen to hear now as well from our other speakers we've got also with us, joining us from Texas, we have Raj Patel. Professor, let's get your take on what you've heard so far. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for uh, inviting me here today. Uh, I couldn't agree more that the soda uh, and the, the, the food industry is targeting children. Um, but I, I want to think, uh, to, to, for us to think a little bit more about what beyond a label on packaging, uh, we might imagine as policy. Uh, because the food industry has been set up from the beginning uh, to exploit not just the tastes of individuals and to create a whole class of consumers that are interested in the wrong things, but also to generate huge social costs. You know, the, the beginning of capitalism starts with Europeans going off to, uh, you know, to, to Madeira, for example, uh, enslaving people and bringing back sugar for the, the elites in Europe. Uh, and things have continued on that trajectory uh, through the United States. I mean, here now, uh, our food industry is a massive cancer on society. There, there was a report released recently by the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, what they found was that here in the United States, we spend uh, $1.1 trillion every year on food. Uh, but the externalities of the, the food system, the costs borne by society in terms of ill health, 
in terms of pollution, uh, in terms of depression. Uh, all of this is much larger than we spend on food. What we spend on food is $1.1 trillion. The externalities are $2.1 trillion. So the real social cost of food in America is the private cost plus the externality. So $3.2 trillion. And that's much, much larger than the private uh, costs of the food system. And so the interesting question for us, I think, is, uh, look, we can put dollar values on the cost of obesity here in the United States, uh, and it is in the hundreds of millions of dollars every year in terms of direct medical costs, and then in additional costs for uh, other, uh, other diseases, in terms of lost productivity, in terms of disability-adjusted life years. There, there are a lot of ways of understanding how much the food industry is not paying. But even if we have the best labeling system in the world, uh, we're, in a, we're in a problematic situation because uh, if, uh, if we have a population that is unable to afford good quality food, as we began this discussion saying, then it doesn't matter how many labels are on the packaging, if good food without the bad labels is too expensive, then we're in trouble. And unfortunately, one of the ways that the food system is successful at externalizing costs is by paying people very little. Here in the United States, uh, seven out of the 10 worst paying jobs in America are in the food system. Uh, and the minimum wage for uh, people in the food service industry who earn $30 a month or, or more on tips, the minimum wage for those people is $2.13 an hour. So it's important to recognize that, yes, we can move uh, consumer consciousness away from the pollution and the toxicity of the food industry, and we must do that. But what we need is much more systemic restructuring of this business. Uh, there is no way that we can allow Nestle, for example, uh, to carry on when they admit uh, that 70% of their food products, 96% of their non-coffee products are unhealthy. And uh, you know, this is the world's largest food company. They will say, oh, we will, we will try and reformulate our products. That's not the issue. The issue is if we have a system that is designed to exclude the majority of people from healthy food uh, and to exploit the environment, to exploit workers, then we, you know, the, our labeling system isn't the problem. Our food industry is the problem. Uh, and regulating them much more systematically is absolutely the way forward. So I'll stop there, but I'm you know, very happy to share examples from elsewhere in the world where systemic change has been happening. But I'm very excited, as you are, to hear from the other panelists. Thank you very much. Yes, indeed. A great introduction from you there as well. And we will, of course, come back to you to hear more of those examples. I will turn now to Malia Cohen uh, from San Francisco. Uh, Malia, give us your take, because I presume your perspective chimes a lot with what you've heard already. Uh, we don't seem to have Mali on the line. I am appreciative of the fact that there is a, a grasp, wide ocean between us and perhaps the technology has failed on this occasion. We'll try to get Mali back in due course. So I'll move on then to Delman Coates joining us from Washington. Delman, are you there? Can you hear us? No, we've lost connection, unfortunately. So what I will do is I know you two, you are here and you've been paying and nodding along uh, with me to, to what you've been hearing. Tell me, we've heard an example there from, uh, from Chile. We've heard the example that uh, Raj gave us there in the situation in the US. What do you see in Europe? Yes, first of all, thank you for inviting me. And it's uh, extremely interesting to take part of this discussion. I think it's timely, important, or maybe it's over time. I mean, we, we should have been more engaged a uh, decade ago uh, or even more uh, longer back. But I must say with the pandemic that we see, it is so important that we recognize the things that um, Andreas told us about uh, uh, figures of uh, people who die from this, uh, four million people uh, today, and also the young people affected, like you mentioned, one out of four uh, in the rich countries, one of eight in the poor countries. 
or developing countries, I should say. This is uh, really uh, shocking. It's shocking and we should uh, recognize that. Uh, and I must say that also what's been said about the, uh, the food industry and its uh, impact on this, or, or it's, uh, it's one of the roots to this problem that we have such a aggressive advertising, that we have such a, uh, also using too much salt, sugar, uh, many of these uh, things that impacts us. But what I could add is the fight for sustainable, a uh, sustainable future that I believe needs to be integrated in this is also the chemicals uh, that we have also in the food emballage. Uh, we have endocrine disruptors that affects us all and we know it and scientists point at this. This leads to many of the things that we speak about as the biggest threats to health. Obesity, yes. Uh, and also diabetes, that's a part of it. Uh, and we know that these endocrine disruptors is part of it. And that's also part of the food. When you go into the grocery, you buy this, you don't know how much salt it is, maybe you don't know how much sugar, fat, but you don't know also that the chemicals that is in the package will also hurt you or hurt your child. And as a mother, I feel angry, frustrated that it's so difficult to go into these stores and know how I could do the best thing for my kids. And I know that mothers, fathers around Europe feel the same. How can you do the best choice? You don't know. You have this vague idea. Maybe it's worse with some pizza. Oh, I don't want to offend <laughs> Italians, but this is, <laughs> this is the truth. People think like that. Or oh, maybe pizza, is, it's better to choose these kind of um, uh, mix of a potato or something that we have in Sweden. Maybe I take that. And, and this may be not the uh, truth. It can be the same salt uh, amount or fat or sugar in the both choices. And you don't see it. So I think this discussion about having a better labeling um, system in Europe is really important too. And I heard that this it doesn't work with the red, green uh, or yellow labeling. Maybe talk about should it be something else. But I mean, Ireland has it. And maybe we need to talk about how to introduce it in the European Union too. And, uh, or it's the UK that has it, sorry. UK has it, this labeling system, but it's not strong enough, I believe. So I conclude that for now, but I have many thoughts on this. Thank you. Well, well thank you for that. Let's, I mean, I think there's a couple of things we need to break down here. One side is the, the labeling and what we are allowing into our food. And then the other side is the sort of the, the, the aggressive marketing and, and the facts of, I'm thinking of the, the Euro football competition and uh, Ronaldo, Cristiano Ronaldo said, drink water. But of course, it was a big soda brand was, was sponsored and they were all banned from saying drink water. They were all told that footballers who obviously care about health and nutrition were told you must actually drink this soda brand. You must have it in front of you. So when you see something like that, that even the biggest football stars in the continent are struggling to get their message across, I think asking a small child to say that they don't want this and they would rather just have, have something without the sugar in it is a really big, big challenge. Um, Andreas. What do you think we can do regarding this? Um, we've heard there from Jutta that reading the backs yeah, uh, of these labels is almost impossible. I think Jutta mentioned one, the, the UK example. They tried on several. They put this uh, traffic light system, like also in, in Chile, uh, the, the law is. So I think the question is how effective it is. But then we have to ask also, maybe we should introduce some taxing of public beds, meaning high, high rate of sugar, costs also a high rate of tax or high rate of uh, unnecessary salts and, 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 and other issues. And then, of course, we should not forget also, in generally, we, we have also the possibility to simply put limits. Uh, and then I think the, the other issue, which is even more complicated, is the psychological one that our advertisement, of course, is telling us that the most, let's say, unhealthy food is the most, just by putting nice pictures of... A, a green field and healthy young kids saying this is the best and then you're in the dilemma like Jutte was mentioning. Honestly, parents don't want to be scientific on, on what food to, to cook. Honestly, you have to do your work, you have to check. You, you want simply to trust the society mm. that if you buy something, you're not poisoning your child, but you're, let's say, feeding your child. And this trust must be fulfilled, maybe also with a, a European law on putting some limits. 
thank you. We're going to now hear a, another example from across the pond, across uh, the Atlantic, from uh, Mexico this time. We have uh, Julieta Ponce Sanchez, who is the director of the Food Orientation Center in Mexico City. Julieta, thank you so much for joining us today. And I hope you've been interested by what you've heard so far. But I will give the floor to you now to tell us about your experience. Gracias. In Thank you. I don't want to repeat what's already been said. When it comes to our experience, I can say that it was a very long battle because uh, industry was using poverty and vulnerability, the vulnerability of the people in Mexico. And just to get to, uh, labeling, which is very similar to the labeling that I have in Chile. And in fact, we were inspired by what they did in Chile, and then we went a bit further. I agree that labeling is the first part of what we have to do to ensure public recognition of which products are harmful and which violate their right to health and nutrition. And we are doing other things as well. In 2014, Mexico was able to impose a tax on sugary drinks. It was it's 10 percent. We wanted it to be 20. And we also managed to recently achieve uh, this labeling. But it was a very difficult battle to get there. There was uh, even espionage spying on people who were supporting the labelling. I think what I'd like to say is that political will wasn't enough to bring about this change. As Guido has already said, you need uh, academia to be on your side, as well as social indignation and political allies and international protection. We think what's really important is that you have one single type of labelling or very similar labelling allow around the world to make international progress. I also agree with uh, Raj Patel when he says that this is just recognition. What you also have to do is make um, healthy food accessible to people as well. I would just like to perhaps mention the fact as well that there ha were four issues that have allowed all of this. First of all, um, when we thought that we were just talking about calories, that only benefits industry. Just talking about calories is not enough. You have to talk about uh, the quality of the ingredients that make up the food. Secondly, the food landscape around people is what actually forms their food habits. We're talking about advertising and for example, uh, everything they see, um, the images get across quicker than word. So, for example, focusing on advertising. Then, um, flavors. Industry has used the same sugar, salt, um, fat. And particularly during childhood, they start to have a standardized uh, palate and then the, um, their taste can't recognize uh, what's a good or a bad product. And so you have to get, well, what happens is the population gets used to eating these uh, poor products and they need to be rehabituated to eating healthy products. Also, we seem to have separated food from climate change and pollution as if these were isolated phenomena. We also have to look at uh, where the money is. 
um, industry are using increasingly sophisticated methods uh, to p uh, sell their products. And so we have to ensure, ensure that we, put, we all uh, work together to put pressure on industry. That's how we'll bring about change. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that. I think uh, some food for thought, as we would put it there. Um, so, Yuta, what, what do you think about, um, if I play devil's advocate for a moment, and say that, well, food companies are going to say they're just giving consumers choice. They're just giving them what, what they want, and no one is forced to buy an unhealthy product. That was... Jennifer, thank you for that question, because I was actually thinking about precisely that. Uh, for so long, we talked about this as an individual choice, like this is... This is the, I mean, the, the, the tabloids are filled with examples. H how do you take care of your body? How to make sure that you are healthy? How do you pr uh, provide healthy way of living? In this unhealthy environment, you are the one who should try to find the healthy ingredients and make your own uh, daily life uh, an exemption from what you, you're living in. And that is not, I mean, it will, it, we will constantly fail. So it, it will not be the solution for the future. And people will also suffer from it enormously. Uh, many people will, through their whole life, try to find ways to change how uh, their body function in this environment. And they will be also having mental issues with it, thinking about it constantly. How can I eat in a different way? Why do we don't do the opposite? Why don't we attack the macro problem and help people live in a world that's more healthy so it doesn't become this individual problem? And that's my point also when I myself go into grocery. I'm not only in politics, I'm also mother. <laughs> and I really see this problem often that I don't find. And my last thing, I went to the States a couple of Oh, it's more than 10 years ago. Uh, and I was, I think it was in Washington. I went to grocery store and I could not find anything, nothing. It was like, where is the all apples? Where do you have vegetables? Where is it? It was only sugar in plastics. Uh, so everything was like unhealthy in this, uh, this store. But I'm afraid Europe is going in the same direction actually. So we need to react to this. Well, let's talk about, I mean, the reasons that people maybe are forced into bad choices. And, of course, cost and finance is one of them. Uh, Raj, if you're still there, perhaps I could get you to weigh in on this point. Because if unhealthy foods are cheaper, then people are automatically going to be drawn to them. Is there a way we can upset that balance? Well, yes. Uh, one of the ways uh, to push back on this is to give people more money. Um, you know, it, it's been, it, it's not rocket science to, to observe that uh, people who are able to buy healthy food want to buy healthy food. Uh, I, I'm also a parent and uh, Jutta, you, your experience sounds so familiar. I've, I've been reduced to tears comparing these two labels and I'm a professor of nutrition. I should be able to do this. And I still find it very, very hard to understand uh, at, you know, at a very high level, what the hell is going on with labelling? And uh, again, this is not to say we shouldn't label, uh, but if our only counter-education to the food industry is something the size of an octagon that's this big, then that's not much of a school, particularly given the, the, the multi-billion dollar industry that is trying to teach us uh, to break our habits. And so I certainly think that uh, the price is an important entry point. Uh, here in the United States, and I'm talking about the United States not because I think the US is the center of the world, uh, but because, Utah, as you say, we are the worst case scenario for Europe. Um, but here, uh, having higher incomes is associated with having better diets. Uh, and the, uh, I mean, so it's certainly the case in research that I've done here that every low income community I study in wants to feed their children well. And they have some inkling of how to do that and are also oppressed by the fact that uh, it's much, much more expensive here to eat fresh fruits and vegetables than it is to find, uh, you know, packaged products that will just keep the kids happy for a little bit because we have such high rates of child poverty. So I certainly think that the, the, the price story is important. 
But I also think that, again, this bigger picture of regulation around obesity is very important. One of the vectors for obesity uh, may be, as Guido was mentioning, uh, the fact that our biology has been changed uh, by having ultra-processed food and ultra-processed environments. So w what you notice about people who have uh, low levels of metabolic disease is that they have a very diverse gut. There are lots of different creatures in our guts that are uh, you know, not human but help us thrive. Uh, with the advent of the modern food system, with its chemicals, with its endocrine disruptors, with its pesticides, uh, we see, particularly in urban areas, a fall in the rate of microbiome diversity. What we also see is that obesity is associated with, with uh, unhealthy microbiomes. So it might be that even if the only thing you care about is obesity, we need to look outside the label to the structuring legislation that allows our bodies to be filled with things over which we have zero choice. It doesn't matter how much money you have. Uh, if you are rich and uh, living in a, an urban area in Europe, you are still exposed to these uh, endocrine disruptors, still exposed to these chemicals. Uh, and therefore, your microbiome is also more likely to get you to a, a place where you're predisposed to metabolic disease. So this is a way of saying, yes, we must raise incomes so that people can make the right choice. We must change the pricing structure so that uh, ultra-processed uh, food with high social costs reflects that cost in the price. But then we also need to think about the costs that are externalized by the food system that Im impact our bodies and impact, uh, as Julieta was saying, the, the climate. You know, it, it, again, we could have the best labeling system and the healthiest food, but if it, doing that on a dead planet, then you know, no one gets to eat. Yes, a very stark warning there, Raj. Thank you. Andres, let me turn to you. We used to have a saying that you know, fat is a feminist issue. Well, surely obesity is a social mobility issue. And we talked about costs. And if you're less well off, you have less choice. That goes without saying. But is there a mechanism we could use, like tax, to make these unhealthy foods less attractive and more expensive? Uh, I, I think yes. Because I, I'm also a little bit fed up by this appealing to the people, buy healthy food, buy biological food. It's sometimes people don't have the time, people don't have the money, people don't have the access in their near neighborhood simply to do it. So it is a little bit arrogant to say you have to look on what you eat. So we have to provide circumstances that people can, can, can afford. And therefore, of course, income is one issue, as, as Raj was uh, mentioning. But on the other side, I think we should really evaluate these uh, systems where we are taxing uh, sugars and, and other high, high nutrition. Because at the minimum, at least it's maybe putting down the amount of, of sugars in, in, in the food. But we have to be clear. And I think this is also important to see it in a system like kindergarten schools, where we feed children. We have to offer best quality food there to, to let's say, to no price for free, so where it, or whatever is the, the public price. So it is also that it's not only the, let's say, the specific children which go to a biological Montessori kindergarten and so on. We want to have best quality for everybody everywhere. I think this is important. Uh, so, but I think there are too few examples on, on policy was too reluctant on this issue. So that's why I think it's an interesting afternoon to know what brings also the example of Mexico, of Chile and of other areas, and what are the results? Absolutely. I mean, we have got some examples. For example, in the UK, there is a tax on sugary drinks. Yuta, would you see something like that being useful at a, at a pan-European level? Bearing in mind, of course, there's only so much we can do with the EU institutions because some of these are member state competencies. Definitely. And that's that why I had a focus on labelling a lot, because I know that we could... Uh, work with that tool. But I absolutely agree what uh, Rai was mentioning about the price and uh, that that must be one of the big uh, change for the future. Uh, I, I'm thinking about, uh, once again, my own personal experience and the stressful uh, daily life we all live in. And, and then 
If you add to that maybe that you don't have much money, you may be single uh, parent, uh, single mom many times, uh, and you have to work, you need to provide food fast uh, after work, uh, you need to, to try to handle Monday to Friday. Of course, you take what's closest, you, tr take, uh, you need to th look at your wallet, and therefore we have a responsibility in the, in the political level to make sure that that environment is helpful for people. And I think also what was mentioned that uh, the United States, unfortunately, is not the, leader sh the leader here. It's actually the opposite. We could say to ourselves, we don't want to go there. Uh, the states are doing many great things, but this is not one of them. We need to take another road and we are already on the wrong road, so we need to turn back and uh, find our own way. Well, thank you. I want to bring Guido, bring you back in, Senator, because you've got this great experience and we heard there Andrea saying we need to learn from places that are doing well. How do you quantify and evaluate the success of this sort of scheme? I think I can see you now. Uh, perhaps you heard me. Perhaps you can answer just a little bit more about your experience and how you evaluate the success of it. Well, first of all, just to clarify, our bill isn't just about the labelling. That's just the whole, the beginning of a whole ecosystem. Because if you have a label, uh, if you have a label, you have options to do various types of things. If you have a black label, you're blocked out of marketing, advertising on television, for example. You can't uh, sell stickers or games to do with the, the food. Uh, you can't sell junk food in schools. That's the whole ecosystem that you're banned from. We also have a tax on sugary drinks. But we do want to increase the tax that we have. Similar to tobacco, you need to increase taxes on tobacco. Uh, the traffic light industry, the traffic light uh, system they have in the UK, that's what industry wants. Red, amber, green, that's what industry wants. That's what they wanted here in Chile because they know that the black label is the one that kids understand best. And we all, know, we all know that people want to um, be aspirational. Kids don't eat food, they eat brands. They're interested by brands. Here in Chile, Coca-Cola, well, they, they're able to sell that, but for Coca, they had, for some of their products, they had to use the black label. But for poorer Chileans, they didn't mind. They just thought Coca-Cola was the thing they wanted to drink. So once we put the uh, label on all of them, then we saw that uh, the people's habits changed. So you do have to understand the mechanism behind how the food industry works, the neoliberal food industry works. That's what we try to do with this law. If you ban industry from any advertising, they would then not be able to sell it. There'd be no publicity. We need to reformulate the way the world works. Everything that's been done in Stanford, I think that shows that we need to make sure that industry, you know, once they're forced to reduce the levels of fat and sugar in their foodstuffs, then they can start advertising again, then they can start selling it again to uh, schools, etc. So there is an alternative, there is a healthy alternative. Before all of this, most products, milk as well, also had uh, salt in them. lots of cereals, lots of sugary drinks, uh, you know, 20% content. So what we're doing now is a green 
label. I agree with what you're saying. It's poor people that are obese, that are undernourished, and they have fewer micronutrients in their bodies. So what we're working on now is this green label. Taxes on junk food, well, that money should be put into um, providing better fruit and vegetables for poorer sections of society and to help these smaller farmers and to uh, Mexico, uh, Julieta, we do need a global system you know it's good that we have these things in Peru, Argentina we've seen things happening in Mexico and Colombia in different places, in Ecuador as well but we need to go beyond that we need to transform this into a global system. I know you're a, a, a long way behind Europe. And I know there are a lot of MEPs, uh, MPs in Parliament, parliaments around Europe. They were obviously bought by industry. But if we see progress in France and the UK, you know, that will definitely be the label that industry wants. What they don't want is the black label. They want the traffic light label. They know because they know that because they know that children understand the black label and not the traffic light label. So we do need to make progress and we need to have an alliance, political global alliance with science, with uh, intelligentsia, with uh, civil society organizations we need a progressive alliance to move to what we want. Just to remind you, we do need to make progress. Here in Chile, I think, you know, we are a laboratory, if you will. We are testing something out. I've been able to go to 30 countries I've cooperated with lots of different countries with Mexico as well I've uh, worked with different scientists in different countries uh, and that's what we saw in Chile as well it was scientists as well pushing this forward but parliaments in different countries obviously they've had different ideas so uh, different ecosystem different protagonists in each country so we need alliances between politics civil society organizations and scientists that's what we need there are lots of things happening in Latin America, lots of uh, countries, Central America, for example. But we do need to go further. We need this alliance. We need Europe on board. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I'm going to bring now Julieta in again as well, because I know you have something interesting to add to this discussion. Sí. Julieta, I can see you. It takes a little Gracias. delay to get across sí. to you, but Perfecto. there we are. No. Uh, yes. In the European discourse, we see something of a risk because what we see now is that there's an increase in poverty and uh, hunger. Therefore, uh, you can't, f you know, you can't think that industry is going to save everyone from hunger. Um, they can't be using technologies that will allow them to produce more and produce more more quickly. That's not what we want to see. This is also what you hear in uh, World uh, Food Summits as well, and it'll also help to generate more food. You have to be very, very clear on this. Um, we also have to remember regulation, for instance. For example, um, maternal health and uh, birth rates. These are future consumers of these uh, uh, products. It's also important when it comes to regulation to think about economies of time. If the, if the proposal, if what we want is the freshest possible food, then that takes a certain amount of time. And you also have to think about who are the people who are cooking most in home? There's a gender perspective to all of this. 
we also have to have a human rights perspective in everything that we do in order to ensure that we have a very clear path and that we're passing the correct regulation and that's what we're saying in with labels we want a clear simple label one that's easy to understand for example the black octagons uh, in order to ensure this right finally i just wanted to say that at this time food strategies have to show that they will generate wealth and fight poverty so we want to see fresh healthy food um, it also will help countries to reduce medicines that are used and to help halt um, chronic illnesses including uh, amongst people affected by COVID-19 um, they're also supposed to be able to show that they can demonstrate more jobs, that they can generate more jobs. How many jobs can we generate by um, growing fresh food, by selling fresh food and preparing fresh food? Or, for example, um, preserving uh, native seeds as well, to give another example. Thank you, Juliet. I want to call back to Raj now because I want to talk about the sorts of foods and the nutritional elements that we're talking about that are specifically in foods, because we've talked about the labelling, we've talked about the cost. Let's talk about what's actually in the foods. Now, here in Europe, we have a thing called the Novel Food Regulation, which defines a substance, a new food, as something that was not widespread consumed before 1997. Um, some of these are great, some of them are less great. Uh, some of them aim to be new sources of vitamins and, and potentially the industry is saying there that we are creating a way to improve health. Um, so there's just a couple of arguments around this debate. What are you seeing um, on your side of the Atlantic? Um, well, unfortunately, what we're seeing is uh, a farrago of products um, with a regulatory regime that is uh, in, in many ways inferior to that in the European Union. Um, and, uh, you know, a, a lot of the, the, the things that end up in our food are, are frankly mysterious. Um, <clears throat> but it is also important uh, to recognise that some of the things that, are, that, that we understand are vectors for ill health have been known about for a very long time. Uh, you know, the, the, the salt and the fat and the sugar uh, that Julieta was talking about earlier on uh, have been uh, reformulated and reconcocted uh, using really exceptionally advanced scientific technique in, in order to be able to make us crave uh, the, you know, the, 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 the product uh, and new technologies of production. So you still have the same ingredients, but now you're reformulating them in new ways. Uh, are, uh, again, providing new kinds of mouthfeel, new kinds of product categories, uh, so that we can um, you know, find new ways to spend on uh, you know, food with questionable dietary uh, claims. But, uh, I mean, for, for me, I think, I, I just want to, to, to build then on, you know, what, what Guido and Julieta were saying, that the way that we have come to recognize certain products as normal, you know, Red Bull, for example, uh, it, which is essentially, you know, the, the, the amino acids that you can find in your own urine, plus caffeine and sugar. You know, this, this is a novel product using some very old, uh, you know, chemi chemical technologies. But you know, we drink Red Bull because of the marketing, because you know, we're working two jobs and we need to stay awake, uh, because we are exploiting ourselves more and more, particularly here in the United States where you know, our working days, our working weeks, working years are much longer than in Europe. Uh, so certainly the social context for the consumption of food is very important. And that's why schools are so vital in this discussion. Um, you know, the, 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 some of the most exciting moments of transformation in the food system are in schools, like in Brazil, for example. You know, there's a very interesting question of how we can afford food that internalizes the costs of, uh, you know, of labor and of the environment and of, of, of health. Uh, one of the ways to do that is for school systems to pay more for agroecologically grown food uh, and to pay more for food that is grown in a local area. Uh, and this, uh, you know, th these uh, policies that were advanced pre-Bolsonaro and have been undone uh, in some ways since then, um, 
have demonstrable effects on child nutrition, uh, but also link schools to an agrarian economy that is already in crisis, right? You know, we've been talking about obesity and food without really mentioning farmers. Uh, farmers here in the US are commodity crop growers. Uh, if we ask them to, to transform into something different, we need to pay for that. And it's okay for us to support our farmers uh, towards a common food policy. Um, but you know, moving to do that, I think, requires care. And I, I just want to end with one example from here in the United States. Um, you know, in the debates around tobacco, one of the mistakes that was made in the 1970s was to start putting a dollar value on the harm that tobacco caused. Now, the reason that was a mistake is because in turning what was obvious suffering into a dollar value meant that all of a sudden the moral high ground was given away and now it just became a question of, you know, what's the right number to achieve and we can hit a balance, as opposed to saying, no, morally you're killing people, you need to abolish this product category. Uh, in the US now, we have uh, uh, some tensions towards just putting a dollar value on uh, the externalities of the food system, but a, a really important leader in changing the food system here have been schools. Uh, schools are using a non-dollar uh, denominated system called the good food purchasing policy, where we value uh, the local economy, we value animal rights, we value uh, nutrition, uh, we value workers, uh, and we, we, we value the environment. And by doing that, food, uh, school food purchases are now shifting to more sustainable, healthy food systems. And it's working for 2.5 million students in the US now. So even though our government has been captured by the neoliberals, our school systems are still capable of doing the right thing. And I think there's a very interesting point of intervention that moves us democratically to be looking at these broad dimensions of food policy change that we need uh, in a way that frustrates the industry, but embraces the fact that this is a gendered issue, a race issue and a poverty issue. Absolutely. Now, you mentioned there, in, as one of your comments, that we haven't mentioned farmers yet. And I'm glad you brought that up because we do have a question coming in from our audience asking, how do we better promote agriculture as a sustainable job for the future as a profession? Because if we do not promote our agricultures, we help them and help them produce healthy crops, we risk having to eat overprocessed food ad nauseum. Thank you very much for that question, as it is really, really key. I mean, here in Europe, we have the recently announced farm to fork strategy that is aiming to reduce pesticides and improve the quality of our food. But what do you think is the key to this, Jutta? Oh, I think there is not one key. There are many keys to this change. Uh, but what we need to know is that many things are interlinked. And uh, if we would like to have a sustainable food chain, uh, then I really believe we need new incentives. And we cannot have this go to the price, lower price uh, um, spiral uh, that is going on forever. Uh, and that has to do with many things. It's the meat, it's uh, milk, it's, uh, the, of course, uh, how to also provide uh, food without uh, too much chemicals, like the endocrine disruptors that I'm so worried about. That's part of this. And therefore, the incentives needs to be more uh, sustainable in the long run. And we need to promote and make it uh, possible for farmers to live uh, out of less production, uh, but with higher quality. And of course, the, the cup reform is also part of this. So it's not only about the farm to fork, but it's also the whole uh, economic incentives. And I, I think we are not there yet. Uh, it's, uh, it's still in this discussion, in this re reform, uh, too much business as usual with a little twist. And uh, it's not enough. I mean, what we hear here is that we need actually a, a revolution of the system. So I think we need to be much more committed to a change and have an idea about how to make it sustainable to produce 
quality food and uh, be able to sell it and not uh, compete uh, with companies who is uh, also driving the wrong incentives. And then my last remark is, I mean, from this summer, the constant nagging about, I want soda, please, all other kids have soda. Uh, and why do we don't drink soda every week, every day, like, or, or this kind of nagging? And of course, you give in sometimes. And even I, who's quite uh, stubborn, give in. And how is it then if you don't have the energy to be that stubborn? Because if you are overwhelmed by your life, by your work, being alone, how can you have the energy to, to go against the whole system on your own? So I think this is really also part of it, that we need the tax uh, uh, on the sugar. We need to do the, also the economic uh, change here. I hear your frustration yes, in your speaking. from this I, summer. Absolutely. I really. There are dietitians who have said, and they say, never eat something that your grandmother wouldn't recognise as a food. And it's quite a nice way to, to <laughs> just keep you on the, on the straight and narrow, as it were. But Guido, let me bring you in here as well. And I'm interested to know what you think in terms of the food production of healthy food, because it's not, I suppose, about just stopping the bad food, it's also about making sure that there is enough access to healthy food as well. Sorry, I didn't get uh, the question, but it's true we do need to change food industry, food production systems. This will have a huge uh, impact, it is having a huge impact on climate change, huge percentage of uh, GHGs are because of what we do in the food industry. But the whole model is there to make people consume uh, and not necessarily anything sustainable. You know, food industry is part of that. Here in Chile, we have an initiative to have uh, to have uh, the food that's uh, that, that could be wasted, not to be wasted, but that is obligatory. It's not voluntary. So we do need to recreate, uh, reform industry, similar to what we did with tobacco. We need to make this whole industry a healthy food industry. There's no alternative. We can't continue to destroy the planet, destroy our biomes. We need an industry that promotes and provides healthy foodstuffs. We need to obviously modify, change, ban advertising. I think the, obviously in the 20th century, we, the main issue was a, fuel uh, and data but now we have to look at what's happening with AI obviously what happens with AI that has an impact on our uh, behavior at this point in time we don't necessarily understand how much publicity advertising children are receiving on average, uh, people in America and Europe are spending about six hours per day uh, in front of their screens. And obviously that is taking away time from their actual um, development. So these are all linked issues. It's a huge risk as far as our metabolism is concerned, obviously, but also of our mental deterioration. People spending time uh, looking at their screens, that's addictive as well, not just sugar and fats. And obviously if you're spending time in with your screens then you can't, uh, you don't have as much concentration, you, you don't read as much. What they do in industry what they basically do is um, modify how children's brains work. We're actually coming up with a law to deal with these sorts of platform, platforms 
through video games, children are receiving, you know, uh, encouragement to, to smoke and to also eat junk food. Because in all of these videos, video games, you see junk food, uh, which is associated with people being happy, um, leaving a happy, leading a happy life. So it's not just about violence and pornography in these sorts of games. We need to look at uh, uh, drugs, junk food, tobacco use. Uh, we have a whole uh, frago of things we have to do. This is where we'll be spending our futures uh, online. But what we see already is that space, that area is already taken by industry, by the indus industrial empire, if you will. Let's be careful. These technologies, AI, are going to be used. They should be used uh, for public good. And at this point in time, you know, we can, well, there are interfaces that mean we can read what people are thinking. Uh, they have w direct uh, insight into people's brains. So this is a new reality. This, you know, we, we, we've ended the last century and now we're in a new century. And uh, screens and uh, technology, this is part of the new century. We. I think, you know, as well as nutritional obesity, we have uh, data obesity, information obesity. People won't be thinking in the future, they'll just be reacting to the stimuli they're being uh, subject to. So to get people's attention, they um, target people's um, primordial brain, if you will. Kids don't go out and play anymore. They're just looking at their screens all day. And they're even, you know, losing sleep. They, they didn't sleep as much as they used to. So screens basically are taking away time um, for kids to be able to develop normally. So we need to look at this in, in that whole context. It's the same sort of consumer model that's being uh, developed. We're not going to be able to deal with climate change, uh, inequalities, if we don't look at the whole thing uh, in context. Thank you. Thank you, Guido. Um, rather pessimistic outlook. I hope we can be a little bit more optimistic by the end of this discussion, at least at thinking we may have tools to tackle the problem. Um, I want to come back to Julieta now because one of the things that has mentioned is the supply chain. It's not just that the food magically arrives in our supermarket shelves. There's a whole process in getting it there. And there have been, over the course of the pandemic, disruptions to that supply chain. And I'm wondering, have you seen anything there that might be a silver lining that causes people to question where their food is actually coming from? Unfortunately, during the pandemic in Mexico, we've seen an increase in um, more indulgent products. Uh, flowers, sugars have increased by about 40%. On, on average, uh, every member of our population put on about eight kilos during the pandemic. So this um, supply chain that you mentioned is a complex process. So we have to focus on a number of different strategies at global level. We have to include the word agroecology. That is going to be um, fundamental in, in avoiding monocultures and so forth. Our suggestion would be to have a list of strategic uh, products, foodstuffs for each country. And they have to have certain characteristics, local production available throughout the year, um, culturally appropriate, having um, a minimal level of processing, being highly nutritional. And this would allow each country to create a list. In Mexico, for example, we'd have maize, uh, beans and so forth. And so what are the um, foodstuffs that are going to generate 
jobs in our country, ensure that the land is cultivated, provide fresh foods and reduce climate change, global warm warming. And that would be different for each country. But it would be a list that would be binding for uh, politicians and policies. The um, chain will only work, however, for fresh products when you have when you're certain that you'll have consumers. And that's the way you can ensure investment, create jobs, particularly for young people. For example, uh, in Mexico, it can help to take people away from drugs trafficking and into farming. Uh, so we also need to look at the the uh, Lancet uh, experts um, recommendations. So reduce uh, consumption of refined flours, limit um, um, egg and dairy consumption, and then move towards products such as plants, fruits, vegetables, fish, um, uh, nuts, uh, beans and cereals and as whole grain cereal as possible and that's the minimum that you can do to increase um, fresh consumption. Thank you. Raj, I noticed you nodding along there to quite a lot of what, um, of what our other speakers were saying, what Guido and Julieta were saying. Did you want to add to that on particularly this question of a supply chain? Well, I mean, I, I certainly am inspired by the work that, that my fellow panellists are doing in Chile and, and in Mexico. Uh, and, you know, it, it's just hard to see the political movement at the national level. And yet there have been the, these moments uh, in local supply chains, even in the midst of this horror of the pandemic, uh, where there have been moments of hope where local supply chains have been more robust uh, and have often been more healthy than the national supply chains providing these uh, commodity uh, products, the, you know, the meat, the heavily processed food, uh, the refined starches. Uh, those supply chains were disrupted because they are fragile, because they rest on neoliberal, just-in-time technology. Uh, but again, it's a very small silver lining in this pandemic. But seeing how peasant movements like those from La Via Campesina in different parts of the world, but particularly in Latin America, uh, have risen to this moment and have provided in a solidarity economy a different way of accessing the kinds of foods we all need if we are to live in a planet that you know, survives through the 21st century. Uh, seeing these ethics of care uh, and of repair uh, d coming together in, you know, it, it's a sort of a glimpse of what a proper global Green New Deal might look like. I, I think that's very exciting. And so there are little things in the supply chain now that can blossom if we invest in them. Thank you. you to, let me come to you then, because I was saying that, you know, we did see the pandemic, a shift in, in consumer behaviour, a shift in what was actually available on the shelves. Uh, Raj says it's a tiny silver lining. Do you agree? Yes, definitely. I believe also for some, it was an opportunity to change the way we live, uh, spend more time with family, th rethink uh, the habits. But that was not for all. So I don't want to end up being pessimistic again. I know you want the optimistic end here. Uh, but <laughs> uh, I, I must say it's really also social difference here because it's definitely um, a middle income class that was home a, a lot working. And then we had a working class who provided things and still were out there in, in that environment, uh, also with the pandemic. And I believe it was not so easy to change habit uh, in, in, in families where you had the same routines. Uh, so I think, uh, yes, uh, maybe that can set a trend. Maybe also uh, the change of habit and rethinking the way we live have, will have an impact also in the years to come. But I definitely think there is a responsibility on this level, on the political level, to talk about this, to have ideas, uh, to listen to scientists, to listen to very excellent uh, also political examples, countries like the ones we got presented here today.
Thank you. Um, Andreas, you've obviously been in strong listening mode today, hearing and, and nodding along with what you're saying and taking notes. Can you give me an assessment of, of what you've heard that you feel might really work for Europe? Yeah, but maybe to come also to this silver lining and uh, COVID uh, chance. Because, of course, we saw thousands of videos where people were baking their own bread at home and this quite romantic uh, videos. And I think we should take them as they are also. It is not the solution, not at all. But maybe it's helping that to open the mind of the people what really is a bread about. What, because sometimes we lost the taste and what the food really is. We have to understand that nowadays milk even is not milk. What comes out of the cow, it is uh, deconstructed and reconstructed. So uh, maybe it's a chance to open the political mind of the people that we need new rules. And this is exactly what we were discussing uh, uh, today. Secondly, we have to understand that the food industry, they don't want to feed the people in the sense of making them strong and healthy. They want to make profit. And the easiest way to make profit is to have low input and high output on the price level. This means you have to be colorful, loud, sweet, salty, selling toys, big advertisement, big show for low quality. Then you have the, the biggest chance to make high profits. And there we have to jump in. And this is what we learned today. Leveling is not only putting traffic lights saying healthy, less healthy, unhealthy, but putting also a black label saying, hey, you are out of the supermarket, you're out of the advertisement, you, let's say, you are really marked as nasty foods. We, we learned about taxing issues. Uh, I think uh, the list of strategic products is an extremely interesting issue because it's also about independence and how, how, how we protect. And what we did not discuss, but what Jutte was saying at the beginning, we should not only speak about the food itself, but also how it is packed, what, what chemicals are in there also. So to understand the whole, the whole thing, I think farm to fork in Europe is a little bit, but honestly, we have to see also the agro industry is extremely strong, also here in the European Parliament. And they are on the other side. And we have to start a fight to make it uh, more people be, uh, more accessible, good food, because it's a social issue. So we cannot say simply buy better food. We have to make a society where people simply get better food. Well, thank you. I think that's a really good summation of everything that we have discussed today. I'm going to turn just one word each from our speakers really briefly. Uh, what is your message to, uh, to the, uh, the politicians here with me in Europe who are going to be taking on the agri-food industry? Have you a word of encouragement, Guido? Lost you. Let's see, Julieta, what is your final word to our politicians here? As they, as they try to improve matters in Europe using legislation. La alimentación. Fresh food is preventative medicine. If we want a healthier future society. Thank you. Thank you. And Raj, to you for your final parting thoughts, please. Uh, from this side of the Atlantic, but also know that there's an amazing grassroots movement ready to lead and to, to follow uh, and support the, the fight in, against the, the food industry. And we're very grateful you're doing it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, Yuta, uh, your sort of final thoughts. So you have some positive, positives there to take away. So I hope next time Def we're speaking, you won't be as frustrated. Definitely. It was so well said by all of the panel. And also, uh, Andreas who said, uh, you don't only say, go buy healthy food. We need to provide healthy food. It needs to be there. It was a really good conclusion from you in the last round. Thank you, Andreas. Um, well done for hosting this event. I think uh, it's been insightful. A fi final word? Just to thank all those who participated online, uh, here in the Parliament, thank you for moderating and all. thank everybody who was watching us and making comments. And it's not the only thing which the GPF was doing, so stay, stay connected with us. Absolutely. Thank you very much to everyone for watching, taking part and following along this conversation on social media as well. Remember, as Andreas has just said, the Global Progressive Forum is a space where you can talk about all these issues, hoping to drive change for a better Europe. So do stay following us online. Thank you very much and have a great day.